And uh, how about that baptism video? Woo, I think, listen, anything in slow-mo looks amazing, period. But that was spectacular. Isn't it great that we're a part of a church that loves to embrace and celebrate life change? Come on. Every time, I, I, I could watch that over and over and over again because it's all about life change and how Jesus changes people's lives, and it's amazing. Uh, we're in a series called Inside Out, and it's all about church, spiritual transformation. And the thing about spiritual transformation, what we all need to be aware of, is that our souls will transform into someone. Whether you're intentional about it or not, your soul will transform into someone. We hope and we pray that your desire is that your soul transforms into becoming like Jesus. Because at the end of the day, when your soul transforms into becoming like Jesus, let me tell you what happened. No matter what's going on in your life, what will surface, what will be elevated, what will come out is joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, grace, humility, kindness, generosity, forgiveness. That's what you're going to be known for. And that's what's going to be second nature if Jesus is the center of your transformation Process. And so this morning, we're going to talk about generosity, okay? Generosity. And what I want everybody to do is participate with me here. I need you to pull out your phone right now. I need, I need 100% movement. Phone or your notepad, doesn't matter, or your notes, whatever you're taking, and write one, two, three. Write one, two, three like a list. Everybody do it. Everybody do it, including you, Russ, back there. I need you to do it, too. Yeah, busted. Got you. Okay, good. Look, he's such a good pastor. Man, he's such a good guy. Make me, put me to shame. All right, here's what I want you to do. You got 15 seconds to write down, 15 seconds to write down the three most generous people you know right now in your life. Three seconds, 15 seconds, write down the three most generous people you know in your life. Write them down. If you're dating, do not put your bay because it's too soon. It's way too soon. But all right, just here's what I want you to do. Go ahead and write that down. I'll count down to 15 seconds. I'm counting down to 10. I think you're a sharper group than the 930, but don't tell them 930 I said that. All right, here we go. 10, 9. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, all right. See, you wrote down these three people, and immediately what came to your brain is why. I, I want to ask you, like, think about what and why you wrote down their name. What is it about this person that's so generous that you immediately said, this person, this person, this person? Let me tell you what it was. It was because when they give to you, they don't ask for anything in return. Because when they give to you, you know it's from a pure place in their heart. When they give to you, they're not keeping tabs and putting it in their pocket, waiting for that moment to call you back on it. They're the ones that you know you could call at any time, and they will be there. So here's my three. I put my three. Can you put that picture up? My three are my mom, my father-in-law, and that guy back there, this guy right here, Mr. Russ. And all honestly... And all honesty, he came into my office, uh, what was it, Thursday? Thursday, he came into my office, and I was like, dude, seriously, I really consider that man back there, honestly, as one of the most generous man, men I know in my life. Seriously, hands down, one of the most generous people I know. Of course, it earned me free coffee at that afternoon, which totally worth it. So, but seriously, these people, why they're generous to me is because they give, and they don't ask for return. They're just givers. They look for need, and they respond to it. And even when there's no need, they just love to give. And that's why you wrote those people. Now, here's the thing about the people on your list. There's something about them that you want, isn't it? Because when they give, you kind of say, I want that kind of generosity. I want to have that kind of spirit. I want to respond to the needs how they respond. I want to respond to people how they respond. I want to use my resources how they use their resources. You see, generous people are, are inspirational people. They do something in our soul. And that's why, ultimately, Jesus is our ultimate source of inspiration for generosity. Because what did Jesus do? He gave his life. See, it says in the Bible that Jesus did not count our sins against us when he gave his life on the cross. That's special. So let's look at what Jesus says in Matthew 6. Let's go to Matthew 6. In Matthew 6, Jesus says this. But when, not if, not maybe, not might... But when, so he's telling you, you're going to be, this is a part of who you are. When you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private and your Father, Heavenly Father, 
God who sees everything will reward you. And I love what Jesus is saying because he's contrasting, okay, he's contrasting these religious leaders who love to give to show off. So when they give, they're like, hey, look how much I gave. Hey, everybody, look at how I'm spending my money. Hey, look how much I'm giving to the poor. Hey, everybody, pay attention to me. And we all know those people. We have those people that give us gifts, and you kind of second-guess their motives. It's like Bill Murray and Scrooge. If you, like, what'd you get, a VCR or a towel? Do you remember that? You know, it's like, ugh. You don't even know if you want it because you wonder. It didn't come from a pure motive. And people that aren't generous, there's no real true motive. You just, you could see it by what they do. And Jesus is saying, hey, look, when you give, just make sure your heart is pure. That's what he's saying. Make sure your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is doing. It's all about pure motives. That who you're trying to impress, that who you're trying to honor is Jesus, is your heavenly father saying, God, because you gave to me, because you are such a generous father, I will give. I will give. So that's what Jesus is talking about. And then here's the coolest thing. Later in Matthew 6, he talks about the heart. Go to chapter, go to verse 21. He says this, wherever your treasure is, wherever the desire of your heart is, whatever you desire the most, whatever you're, you're wanting, whatever pulls you in most in your heart, there the desires of your heart will also be. It's like this treasure is where your desire is. This treasure what pulls you. So what's that treasure for you? What's that treasure? That's, that's where all your finances is going to go. That's where all your mind power is going to go. And Jesus says, hey, make sure this is right. Make sure that the treasure is me. Because if the treasure is me, it changes the course of your life. It changes how you see money. It changes how you see everything. Because here's the thing about money. We all like it. Let's just be honest. We all love money. This is for real. Like, it's okay to say. Like, we like it. The problem is, is how we use it, right? The problem is, is what is it, what do we allow it to do to our hearts? The problem is, is the problem is when we say, okay, God, you know, thank you for giving me what you gave me, but I'm going to keep mine and you will get yours when it's convenient. And what we like to do is keep an arm's length. We like to like Heisman God when it comes to money, right? And keep it for ourselves. Man, let me tell you what. 9.30, same reaction. Talking about money is as awkward as talking about sex at church. I'm telling you, like, all of you are like, oh, crickets? Like, seriously. Because when you talk about money, doesn't it get here? Doesn't it just tug at your heart a little bit? So Jesus is saying, hey, make sure your heart's right. Make sure your heart's right. Because the Bible talks about money. It talks about three types of giving. Here you go. It talks about tithe, offerings, and alms. Tithes offerings and alms okay now here's the thing if if you call yourself a follower of jesus christ like sincerely you say i follow jesus this is for you and if you're not please listen how we talk about people in our family because if you're not a christ follower you could just listen in and you get to absorb but if you are a christ follower this is obedience obedient like you this is not optional this is like god is blessing you and out of the abundance of your heart, like out of a natural response, you give. And the Bible talks about it in Malachi 3.10, hey, make sure you, you, you give to God and test him on it. Like that's the only time God says, hey, try me. Try me and watch what I do. Because God knows how money could grip you and mold you and darken your soul. And he says, hey, trust me, because if you give and you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, what you're giving to is life change. How many of you love that, that baptism video? You know what we're giving to? We're giving and saying, God, thank you that you changed those lives. Thank you that what we saw was people's lives being changed, families restored, eternity secure. And I'm going to keep giving to that because you keep doing that. And tithing is just a way of saying thank you to God out of obedience. So if you're a Christ follower, you must be tithing. If you're not tithing, shame on you, and then it's between you and God. And my job is just to tell you, don't rob God on this one. Don't rob God on this one. Okay? God, I'm telling you, God wants to bless you, and I'm telling you, if you keep this away from God, you say, no, God, I can tithe how I want and do what I want. And you start snapping your fingers at God, thinking you know better than him. That's on you. That's going to be on you. And so obedience, 
I'm telling you, tithing is all about obedience, and we give because we love God, and God loves us, and we love seeing how he's changing lives in a way of us saying thank you for him changing ours. So that's why we tithe. We give the first 10%. And I'm telling you what, my, I grew up this way. Parents, teach your kids this now. My mom always gave me money to put in the offering plate, always, always. I just had it ingrained. So every Monday, bing, automatic alert, giving, because I will forget. I don't, I'm not about writing a check, like save the trees, okay? Just put it automatic. I, I don't need somebody, someone's like, but it feels good to write. Great for you. What feels good is that I do it. And what feels good that I'm reminded that I did it, you know? And so put that habit in. My kids now know, you know, when it comes to money and to, like they say, okay, here's the money. And it's funny because they recognize money real quick at seven years old. Gabriel, my oldest one, broke a bat at a birthday party. Uh, our friends, kids had a birthday party. Gabriel broke this little boy's bat. And I was like, Gabriel, you got to have to pay for that. And suddenly it was like I tore out his heart. I was like, no. It's like, you're seven. You're starting to understand money. It's great. You know, but he understands that. And so we tell him, hey, when you get your money, what do you do? You give to God, you give to the poor, and you save. I want my boys to know that. So start training now. Because tithing really makes a difference. And then offerings and alms, it's kind of, it's, you heard what Russ was saying about what our church has been doing. Here's the two pictures. This is really great. I want to put up a picture right now. First, let's talk about alms. This is Houston. And this was our, 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 what we provided for, for Puerto Rico. Isn't it amazing that our church is giving $10,000 to hurricane relief there? And isn't it awesome that our church, in an, in an instance, we're like, hey, we got to help. Uh, what's going on in Puerto Rico. We've got to help our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico. And immediately, you all responded with over 20,000 items. I love being a part of a church that has that quick of response. I love giving to a church that you could see the immediate effects of it. Isn't that amazing? It's a, the clap moment. Yeah, it's amazing you get to be a part of that. Now, here's the other thing. We give to the poor and we give to the needy. And in, in in that drop of a dime, and I love it. You know what else, what else we give to as a church? When we go to offerings, offerings and tithes are above. I mean, offerings and alms are above your tithes. All right, so here's your tithe. And then whatever you give here, you don't replace one with the other. And the cool thing is, is that when we do offerings is what we're giving to our vision. When you hear us say, if you want to put a, a, a campus or, or, a, or a service within 15 minutes of, of our, 15 minutes of our mission field, you're going to say, wow, I got to give to that because lives are being changed. So I want to fund that. I want to get to that. When you hear about a church in Utah, when you hear about a church in Miami, whoo, that means lives are being changed. That means more baptism videos. See, we give because Jesus first gave to us. And, Jesus, and God's telling, hey, those three things, it's training you on how to appropriate your money so that you can see life change. So that I can change you. Because the last thing you want to do is be a miserable person. And I want you to write this down. Misery. Misery comes from clinging. Joy comes from generosity. And we all know that. We all know this to be true. You go to a birthday party and you put a bunch of four-year-olds and five, like three to five. Put those kids together and you're going to see clinging like crazy. No one teaches stinginess. It's in us. And just, and when you go to those parties, you don't want to be the parent where, like, you have to teach your kid how to share. You know what I'm talking about. It's embarrassing. When your kid is the one taking everybody's toys, when your kid isn't the one sharing, it's like, ooh, that parent needs some lessons in parenting, right? We all say that. Don't judge me. We've all said it. But we've all been those parents, haven't we? And what do we teach our kids? Hey, share, 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 share. Why? Because we know that joy comes from sharing. So here's what I want to do. The rest of our time, I want to look at a, a neat community in the Bible. And in Acts chapter 2, don't put the picture up yet. In Acts chapter 2, what you're going to see is the very first community of Christ followers and how they were generous. But I want to show you something cool. So when preparing for the sermon, here's the headline picture in my Bible of this community. A generous and growing church. This was the, the headline describing the first community of Christ followers. How cool was that? A generous and growing church. This is what the very first Christians were described as. A generous and growing church. So let's break this down and, and get into it. So let's go to, look at Acts 42, 242. It says here, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now here, I want you to know that simply, 
what the Bible and the writers are telling us, what Luke is trying to show us right now, is saying that they were intentional. They were generous with their tithe. They were intentional about spiritual transformation. That means they came to church on Sunday. That means they weren't part of a small group. They wanted to put themselves in any environment that advocated, that cultivated, that, that nurtured, that challenged, um, that challenged spiritual transformation, especially generosity. So let's go to the next verse. It says here, everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Everyone, all kinds of people were witnessing this. Now, here's the cool thing. Filled with awe, because they started seeing God move through the apostles. You know what, the, you know what that shows of me? You know what that, I want to inspire you with this text? Is that leaders led the way. See, the apostles were the leaders of this community, and they led the way with generosity. They led the way with insane amount of love and grace, but they were the first to give. So if you're in this room, and you lead a small group, or you lead in any way, shape, or form in anything, I just want to say, I am so glad to be with you in this church. If you're leading a small group and you open your home, if you're a volunteer and you're a leader, maybe you're a leader here of ushers or you're a leader of greeters, maybe you're a leader in any capacity in this church, as a staff member, thank you. Because Jesus is doing stuff in you through your generosity, leading other people to be more generous. There, we have countless stories of small group leaders leading in the way of generosity. Of small group leaders talking about their stories of tithing and how it inspired these people to give and to tithe and say, wow, I've got to put God first. How these, there's stories of other leaders leading the way and saying, we will lead first. And because we led, families were restored. People came to know Jesus. Man, you know, people were set free, whether from addictions, and in that time in the first century world, probably actual slavery. Man, if you're a leader in this church, I just want to thank you. And if you lead in any way, can we all just clap and thank them for leading a small group in any shape? If you're a leader, could you lead the way with generosity? You lead the way. It inspires people. So let's look at the next verse. Verse 44. Now all the believers were together together. And held all things in common. All. All. Let me describe all. All back in that time, especially in the context of the first early church, it was like the United Nations. It wasn't just your context of what you see. Oh, maybe just this kind of people. No, no. It was black. It was white. It was brown. It was rich. It was poor. It was slave. It was free. It was a man. It was women. It was men and women. It was children. Everybody. It was poor. It was wealthy. It was business owner. It was worker. It didn't matter. It was everybody. And they all had this in common. Your needs before mine. But where do they get that idea from? Jesus. They all said, okay, Jesus, your king, your lord, your savior, your way, not ours, okay? Jesus, you lead the way. Your way, not mine. It's funny because later on Paul writes about who Jesus was. Remember he says this in Philippians 2? It says that Jesus came down, was obedient to the point of death, gave, died for us, and then what happened? God elevated him to the point of king and savior. And all of us will bow down to him one day, one day. But it all started with Jesus saying, hey, your needs before mine. And what these believers said, okay, your needs before mine. Okay, so Jesus, we have this in common. So we're all going to tithe. We're all going to give offerings, and we're all going to give to the poor. It wasn't, it wasn't like a negotiation. It wasn't like, should we? It was like, when can we? It was contagious. They all wanted to. Small groups are like, hey, we got a need. Let's go answer that need. Hey, we got to do this for the church. We want to put another church over there in that city. Okay, let's send money to it. Hey, let's send bodies over there. They all had Jesus in common, and Jesus was extremely generous with them by changing their lives. And they would just wanted to see more people baptized and more people saved. That's what they had in common. So go to the next verse. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Now here's something I want to show you. This is really neat. See, when you get to this phase, spiritual transformation is happening drastically and rapidly because they cultivated it. Can you put up the five reasons those five things, please. Here you go. Five reasons why, five reasons why generosity leads to spiritual transformation. Here it goes. For all you note takers, ready? So put it all right here, right now. It honors God. 
It makes me more like Jesus. It is the antidote to materialism. It demonstrates my faith. It will be rewarded in heaven. What I love about this text, about, about these five points here, guys, hear me out. You see that in the first community. You saw that in first 42, 43, 44. And especially here when you see them saying, go back to that last verse that we had up. They sold their possessions and property. That means they didn't care about the materials. They're like, get rid of it, get rid of it. I have property over there. You know what? Oh, there's some land. Let's put a church there. Let's put another community there. Oh, hey, I got some property. You know what? Let me get the money for it, and let's fund what God is doing over there. Let's send some pastors over there. Oh, wait, 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 wait. You know, I hear some needs over here. Hey, let's get that going over there. Let's make sure these people have food. Like, people were just so generous. Because they captured this idea, you know, that Jesus was better. That generosity made him more like Christ. Here's what I want to tell you when it comes to this. Because when we talk about money, I know that some of you have a hard time giving because you're like, well, you got to apply wisdom. And you're right. You apply wisdom. You should apply all the wisdom. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Generosity, and I would like you to write this down. It's not up here on the board. This is, this is tweetable. So you can comes in very small characters. Generosity is more about obedience than wisdom. Generosity is more about obedience than wisdom. And let me tell you why. Let's say that Jesus was in the garden and he had to start calculating, right? Should I die for Marcia? Marcia's gonna lie to me. Marcia's gonna cheat. Marsha's going to hurt people's feelings. See, if God began to calculate, if Jesus began to calculate all the reasons why not to give his life for me, I'm done. And so are all of us. But aren't we glad that we serve a generous Savior? See, when it comes to giving, it's more about obedience. Yes, seek wisdom, but if Jesus tells you to give, he's calculated the cost for you. Especially if you want to please God. So, a couple years back, oh no, more than that. Uh, let's just say it was about, it was before I had kids. I think it was uh, about eight years ago or so. Eight, nine years ago. Uh, I took a couple of leaders of mine, uh, the student ministry that I was leading, and these are two college students, and we went downtown to serve in a ministry. And this ministry, they served uh, people that just got out of parole. Right? They just got on parole and got out of jail. And also, they served the people that were on parole, but they also had HIV. So they served an HIV, uh, people with HIV, a community of people with HIV, as well as people that just got out of jail. Talk about double outcast, right? These people had the hardest time finding jobs. So we go and we go have dinner with them. We just go meet. I'm trying to learn about the ministry. And then I tell Kyle, I was like, hey, Kyle, let's take two of them home to learn more about their story. So we get in the car. And we're driving. And during this season of my life, how many of you have ever had some type of purchase that you just love to buy? Like for some of you, it's sneakers. Like you'll go and you'll spend thousands of dollars on sneakers. Sneakers is it. For me, during this particular season of my life, it was track jackets. I was infatuated with track jackets. I had an abundance of track jackets. And this one was an expensive track jacket. I loved this track jacket. Why I wore it that day, I don't know. But I love this track jacket. So I'm in my car with Kyle, and if you've walked with God long enough, you've had that day where God speaks to you pretty audibly and everything else drowns out. You know what I'm talking about? So I'm in the car, Kyle, the two guys in the back, we're driving them, stop sign, everybody's talking, having fun, we're learning about their story. Suddenly God says, Marcio, give the man your track jacket. I'm like, no. Yeah. No. No, God, no. I look at Kyle, Kyle, did you say that? He's like, no. would say what? I'm like, oh. No, God, no. So the whole time I'm driving, I'm having this dialogue with God. I'm like, God, I'm not giving the man my track jacket. Track I mean, it's my favorite track jacket. Like, I love this track jacket. This track jacket and I are one. I, like, I love the color blue. It hasn't faded. It's like this is a strong blue. It brings out my eyes, which is not true. And I did all this stuff. I just started talking, talking. And I was trying to, and everybody, I was ignoring everything that was going on back there. So I get to, I, and you know when you're in that moment of talking, you don't even realize how you get to a location? You just drive, it's like autopilot. And I'm like driving, driving, stop. Hey, have a good day. I'm not giving the dude my jacket. I'm not giving the dude my jacket. I'm not giving the dude my jacket. And I get to the next stop where the guy that I had to get the jacket out, he gets out of the car, he's walking away. 
God's like, stop him. Stop him. God, hold on. And I'm like, hey, man, how you doing? And God told me to give you this jacket. And I prayed for him. I walked in my car. Kyle's like, you gave him your jacket. I'm like, don't talk about it. We're out of here. You know? like, I don't want to talk about steel dealing with it, right? And, and I left. So this week, in praying and thinking about the silly story, small thing of generosity, right? It was something so minute. About four or so years later, I totally did something dumb. I was working as a server while I was, I was, I was a student pastor, and I was working as a server on Friday and Saturday nights, and I was driving down 535, and those roads are fun to drive. So I had my Mazda Protégé 5, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretending like I'm Vin Diesel in Fast and Fierce, and letting it rip, and suddenly I jacked up my engine. Bad. My fault. Stupid me. My fault. Not very long after that, someone gave me their van. And I told you the story. But what, what was interesting, someone gave me their van, their minivan. And like, here, take it. Oh, by the way, we're going to pay for it. We're going we're gonna to pay for all the, the tags and all that stuff. You don't have to worry about anything. It's yours. And what God was wanting me to tell you, hopefully encourages you, look, the acts of generosity you do here, you do now. You might not see the reward of that, and God might not connect the blessings of that till years later. Because it was about four or five years after that moment that something happened like that. And you have no idea the effects of your generosity. So much so, listen to the scripture. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine in such a way that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Your acts of generosity, when you give your money to the things of God, you have no idea how that's going to bless you later, how God's going to be like, hey, because you gave, I'm looking out for you. I got you. Because what, as a parent, wouldn't we do that to our kids? And what we see here in that text, go back up. Go back up with that text. Here's what people did. They gave, they gave. Now, here's the results of it. Go to the next verse. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They couldn't stop getting together because generosity was flowing. They're like, I got to be around these people. Here's the best part. In 33 AD-ish, what temple and house means to us today was that translate this to today's time 2017 33 AD ish they were going to the temple and they were going to house what does that mean for us in 2017 you go to church and you go to small group church and small group you love being around the community of Christ followers why because it inspires generosity and that they're like we got to keep getting together with people we got to keep getting together with people and they kept meeting together and eating with joyful and sincere hearts verse 47 praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, remember, Jerusalem was a, was a big city. Jerusalem had all kinds of cultures there. Don't forget that the first century church was in the midst of the Roman rule. Right? They were under and oppressed by the Roman Empire. So can we dream a little bit? See, when, you get script, when you're reading scripture, I pray that you think outside the lines of what could happen sometimes. So dream with me. What if in a small group... One day there was a guy named Bill, and Bill was in the small group. And Bill, uh, the Bible said, well, the problem with Bill, and when he leads his Bible study, is that he has to go home quickly, and he's, he's scattering the time he, he could come and lead the Bible study because Bill's a slave. See, Bill had no rights. Bill was no different than this inanimate object. That's how people, that's how they treated slaves back then. They were just objects. But see, in the small group, under, the, under Jesus, Bill was equal. Bill was free. Bill was valued. Bill was loved. Bill was somebody because of Jesus. And all these people didn't see Bill as a slave. They saw Bill as Bill, the beloved child and brother of Jesus Christ. Bill's like, yo, I got to go. I got to go back to my master. So Bill runs out. And let's just say the small group got together. They're like, hey, let's help Bill out. Hey, let's put together. Bill, I heard Bill say that he has about two or three years left on, on, on his debt as a slave. What if we paid it? And by the way, what if we paid the two to three years and added an additional year or so to be extra generous to the master, to show him what Jesus is all about? So one day I can imagine Bill's working and the master's just chilling as all his other people are working. And then one day here comes this entourage. 
of people of his of Bill's small group. But before they go there, they went to the, let's just remember, dream with me. Maybe, maybe they went to Peter, James, John, and the boys. They're like, hey, we're planning on doing this. They went and sought wisdom. And they're like, yeah, the, the, the disciple, the leaders were like, yeah, go do that. It's a great idea. It's a great idea. Go. So they sought wisdom. They prayed. They fasted everything. And then they went and they acted. And then they are coming now with money. And the master's like, who are these people coming into my house? What are they about to do? They look like they're going to ransack me or something. So he's throwing his sets up. And he's ready to go down with it. And Bill's like, no, 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 no. Hey, master, listen. Um, they're my friends. They're my friends. They're my friends. It's like, what are they doing here? So they imagine, imagine, imagine the scene. They walk in. They look at the master and say, hey, you know, Bill, he's our friend. Bill? Bill's just an object. He's nothing. Well, let me tell you about Bill. Bill, because of Jesus Christ. You remember that guy that got hung on the cross? Remember that guy? You guys are still following him? Yeah, we're still following him. And because of he died for all the wrongs we've ever done to God, to others, and ourselves. And he saved us. And in and, and his eyes, we're free because of his generous love. And, and, and so is Bill. And to Jesus, Bill is one of us. We don't see him as a slave. We see him as an equal partner. In life, and what we want to do, sir, we want to give the rest and pay off the rest of Bill's debt, but then we want to add on to that because we know you have to find some work in between there. So we're going to add on to that. Can we have Bill? Favor, favor, favor. What do you think happened to the other slaves? They're like, Jesus, Jesus, I got to be a part of that community. I got to figure out how to be a part of that community. What do you think the master said? I'd hire those people, I want those people around. When you're generous, you're generous, you open the door to talk about Jesus. Your generosity opens the door to have Jesus conversations. Opens the door. And here's the best part. Ready, ready, ready? Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Every day they were baptizing people. Baptizing people. Baptizing people. Why? Because people gave. They were a generous church. You had a need? Let me show you. Here, meet your need. Let me tell you about Jesus. Oh, hey, we got to put on a church over there. There's some property. We got to buy that property. We're going to put a campus over there within 15 minutes of our mission field. We're going to put over there because people need to know Jesus. They all had, let's get the word of Jesus out. And let me tell you what, the best way to get the word of Jesus out is to put your money where your mouth is literally. Right? Let's win people over with our generosity. And let's, just real quick, isn't it good that you're a part of a generous church already? Amen. Aren't we glad that we're part of a generous church that sees life change? So let's continue that. Let's transform our souls by being generous people. Amen.